apes, monkeys, and lemurs, oh my, these magnificent animals are all members of the order primates. Hello everyone and welcome to Lunch Break Science and happy early Earth Day. I'm Ariel Johnson from the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit that supports human evolution research and shares discoveries. Be sure to subscribe to our channel and smash that notification bell so you hear all discoveries first, well not all discoveries, but major discoveries uh, from us directly first and from the scientists involved. Also, tell us where you're joining from in the chat or the comments, whether you're watching live or catching the replay. We're just excited to see who's here. And today is all about answering your questions, so be sure to get your questions in. Um, we have a wonderful lineup of primatologists joining today, the most primatologists we have ever featured on Lunch Break Science. So I'm very excited. So first, uh, we have um, Mercy Akinyi. <laughs> okay, sorry. There we go. Now we have Mercy, who joins us from Kenya, where she is a research scientist and veterinary doctor at the Institute of Primate Research in Kenya. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, next, we have Brenda Bradley, who's Associate Professor of Anthropology at the George Washington University, member of the Center for the Advanced Study of Human Paleobiology, and member of the Leakey Foundation Scientific Executive Committee. Hi, all, and thank you, Ariel, for organizing this event. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, so uh, next, we have uh, Chris Sabai who is a college fellow at Harvard University in the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology and a researcher at the Kabali Chimpanzee Project. Thanks for having me, Ariel. <laughs> uh, and and um, next we have Christopher Schmidt, uh, who I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call you Christopher today so we don't get mixed up between the two <laughs> Chris's, um, who is Assistant Professor of Biological Anthropology and Co-Director of the Sensory Morphology and Anthropological Genomics Lab at Boston University. And last but not least, we have um, Dr. Aaron Vogel, who is a professor uh, in the Center for Human Evolutionary Studies at Rutgers University. Uh, Aaron is also co-founder and co-director of the Tuanan Research Station in Central Kalimantan, Indonesia, and, and works with orangutans. So nice to be here. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. Okay. So again, we are here answering your questions today, and uh, we're going to just go ahead and jump right into our first question, which is, what is a primate? So, Aria, oh, should I jump in? Yeah, please do. And answer that? Okay, I don't know how, how fast we're waiting. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna jump in and answer this one for the group and please uh, everyone add in if you have any questions. But what's really interesting is there's a number of traits that kind of come together to define primates. And we might have some exceptions to some of these traits as well within the, the order. Um, but in general, uh, most primates Primate species have what we call opposable thumbs, um, opposable big toes, and uh, the presence of five digits, so on their appendages. Um, and a lot of most primates have flat nails instead of claws, instead of curved claws, but there are some exceptions to that, and pads at the tips of their fingers. Um, in addition to this, um, primates typically have very good depth perception and what we call binocular vision, and relatively slow reproductive rates compared to other mam mammalian species of uh, the same body mass. And they also have relatively large brains compared to most other mammalian species of equivalent body mass as well. And another trait is uh, what we call these post-orbital bars, which are bony rings that completely surround kind of the eyes. So those are some of the traits that make up primates, but maybe others want to add to that list. I study um, primate genetics, and uh, people might not be aware that there are also genetic signatures in the genome of what it is to be a primate, or genetic signatures of being a primate. There are these little genetic elements called alus that you find in virtually every primate, but no other animals that aren't primates. <laughs> They don't really have much of a function, but they must have evolved in the genomes of the earliest primates, and now we find them in all primates. So I find it interesting that there's also kind of this genetic barcode of being a primate as well. Uh, 
we also had a question um, asking us, are we primates? Yep, <laughs> we are. Okay. I think we are. I think we are. The similarity that we see uh, between ourselves and other primates in terms of behavior similarity and uh, the physiological traits as well and genetics, as Brenda has mentioned, all of those things, the percentage similarity is so high. And a lot of times for us here in Kenya, we we actually refer to primates as non-human primates, just to distinguish between, I think, the human and the and the primates. But we 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 call our primates here in Kenya non-human primates. Yeah. Well, uh, I know we we said that we would be answering your questions, but we actually have a question for you out there, our viewers. Um, we are going to have a quick quiz uh, where we were going to ask you to identify which of three photos is not a primate. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll, how it will work is we will have the image of the three primates. It will be an A, B, or C option. Um, you have 30 seconds to submit which of the three prime or three animals uh, you think is not a primate. And there are extra points if you can tell us what type of animal that non-primate is. Okay, so if everyone's ready, let's get that quiz up. Okay, we will wait a few moments for for um, people to submit their answers. And maybe, actually, maybe, you know what, why don't we give people another, oh, no, we, okay, here we go. Yeah, we'll give them another 30 seconds. This is a little tricky. Or maybe not. <laughs> Does anyone know what the what the non non primate is though? That's the question. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the answers here. We have B. All are primates, persimians, I believe. Uh, B. Let's see here. B. Okay, so A is a tarsier and C is a bush baby. But so there's a general sense of no idea what B is. Oh, oh, Jonathan, thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's look at the let's look at the answer. <laughs> yes, um, uh, it is a uh, the flying lemur in the middle is not a primate, and uh, yes. Uh, uh, Jonathan and Keith, it is also known as uh, Kalugo. Um, so congratulations, um, Jonathan and Keith for getting the correct name of the animal. And congratulations to Pete, Mary, um, uh, Renee, and uh, Keith for getting the answer correct. Um, would somebody uh, like to just uh, quickly chat about why the flying lemur is not a primate? Let's let's get the um let's get the uh So as you see the flying lemur uh does not have uh the the same post orbital bar that the um that the uh other other animal or mammals or animals I guess are both animals and mammals have yeah, I love okay. that the flying lemur is so poorly named because it's not a lemur and it doesn't fly. <laughs> okay, um, now let's go on to our next question. Um, so this was actually came, we had a YouTube poll um, as to what people were most interested in hearing about. And about 75% said that they were interested in hearing about primate language. So uh, what language or systems of communications do primates use? 
And I think, uh, Christopher, uh, you, you had some thoughts on primate language. Yeah, I, I can talk about it a little bit. Um, I mean, the first thing I'll say is is whether or not primates have language really depends on how you define language. So, um, you know, like primates are not communicating with like complex syntax like we do, and they're not doing it orally with because we've got actually a relatively unique morphology in our nasopharyngeal mouth region with the tongue that allow us to make language um, compared to other non-human primates. Um, but also, you know, it's, this isn't to say that non-human primates aren't communicating with each other. So I study vervet monkeys and there's some very famous studies looking at vervet monkeys using what we might think of as like symbolic reference. So vervet monkeys have different alarm calls that indicate different predators and they respond to them appropriately. So if they hear an alarm call for a snake, they recognize that that alarm means snake and they'll jump up off the ground. Or if they hear another alarm that means bird, they'll look up um, and they understand that that different sound means, is referring to something different. So that kind of symbolic reference is something kind of close to language, but it's not language in the way that we think of language necessarily, which is you know communicating again with complex syntax. But there are some apes that are capable of learning language systems like ASL and can even use grammar. So it's not that non-human primates are incapable, but you know, naturally they, it's actually quite a rare thing to see in, outside of humans. Hi. <laughs> well, I'll start from scratch there. So um, we have a question from our one of our viewers, uh, George, uh, who is curious about what we know about the divergence of the hominid and uh, subfamily uh, chimps and humans from other apes. When, why, and what landmarks are on the way? This, this is where it'd be good to have a, a paleo person. I should have thought to like have uh, someone doing research on primate paleoanthropology, but. Um, Oh, okay. <laughs> Christopher? Yeah, I can try a little bit. Um, so <laughs> my understanding is that, you know, in the, in the fossil record of Europe, we actually have an ape called Dryopithecus that maybe dates to nine-ish million years ago, maybe earlier. Um, I forget, like sometime in the mid-Miocene, so maybe actually more like 12 to 15. Um, and Dryopithecus supposedly has a morphology in the skeleton that looks kind of like it would be basal to um, the African ape clade. So it's not quite chimpanzee human, it would include gorillas, um, but there's that fossil record that suggests that that maybe happened in Europe when the apes had migrated there in the mid-Miocene when it was much warmer and that they subsequently migrated back into Africa um, after that and then diverged into gorillas, chimps, and humans. As far as like the last common ancestor of chimps and humans, I think, you know, there's a lot of debate around that and, and that I'm not as familiar with, so I don't think I can address that. So, um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Brenda, did you, or I guess, does anyone um, else have something they wanna add? <laughs> I was just going to tag on to, to that, that, you know, probably the split between the lineage that led to humans and the one that led to chimps and bonobos, it's probably kind of murky over a period of time of four to seven million years ago. But it's really interesting that we have this pretty extensive fossil collection for the lineage leading to humans now, but virtually no fossils for what was happening during this time on the lineage that led to chimps and bonobos, probably in part because of where they were living was just not you know, conducive to fossil preservation. But it's kind of sad that we don't have parallel fossil records to look at what was happening in both lineages during this time. Absolutely. Um, so we, we uh, our next question comes from uh, Diane, and this came from our website. Uh, you know, when we think of, of, of primates living close to humans because they overlap so much, you know, you think of disease transmission like Ebola, what are the most common diseases that uh, are transmitted from hum from primates to humans. Uh, and I, uh, Mercy, it seems like you'd probably be the person to field this question. Thanks, Th thanks Ariel, and thanks for the, for, for the question. Um, generally, when we look at the causes of diseases, they could be viruses, they could be bacteria, or even parasites such as helminths. What I work on most of the time is helminths, and helminths 
um, they're easy to detect or easy to screen for, and they're transmitted um, through uh, like uh, contamination of water or leftover foods. So we're looking at shared resources between humans and primates, and uh, this is why the transmission is easily uh, can easily be done. And this is also inclusive of bacteria as well. Uh, with regards to viruses like Ebola and so many other viruses, simian formiviruses, amongst others, these are mostly transmitted through contact. And uh, these are in areas where people are um, selling bushmeat and eating bushmeat. And it is um, in different places in Africa, there are people who actually eat uh, primates or even come into contact uh, with the same. Uh, I'll let the others uh, chip in. Yeah. So I think, uh, Chris, you had some um, some input on this one. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, I mean, obviously, Mercy has really great hands-on experience with uh, dealing this from a wider perspective. But like one thing that I think, so I study wild chimpanzees. And, you know, often what we're thinking about is like the opposite direction. What are... Oh, I think we 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 lost Chris. Um, uh, Christopher, do you want to uh, chime in on Vervets while we wait for uh, Chris to come back? Yeah, sure. So I was going to make um, kind of the same point that Chris was going to make. So I study vervet monkeys, and they have a lot of contact with humans, for, like all over Africa and also in the Caribbean. And what we see is uh, what we would call anthropognoses instead of zoonoses. So these are diseases that get passed back into primates from contact with humans. Um, and in vervet monkeys, we see like um, like methicillin resistant staph infections getting transferred from them to humans, um, and also various other kinds of like flu like viruses being passed from um, them to humans. And we did a study even looking to see if COVID could be passed um, to them from humans, and it looks like they would be susceptible, although that susceptibility varies. So, yeah, I mean, like we worry about it in both directions, um, because obviously, especially when there's high contact between humans and non-human primates, this is always a possibility, as, as Mercy's research kind of demonstrates firsthand. So, well, um, maybe when Chris comes back, we can um, uh, uh, hear more about what she was thinking. But let's take uh, our next question from our viewers, uh, which comes from Pete. Um, do ver the various species of baboons ever encounter each other and do they interbreed? So uh, who would like to tackle this one? I, I uh, can see. see. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I have had some, uh, some, some time to work with the Amboseli Baboon Research uh, Project. And there's uh, the two species, the Papua Anubis, which is the olive baboon. And then there is the yellow baboon, which is the Papua cynocephalus. And a lot of the research that they've done is that there's always an admixture, which means that these two uh, species of baboons do breed. So at least for Kenya, there's evidence that um, there's breeding between those two species. With regards to the rest of the baboon species, I have, I have no clue. Maybe someone else can, can chip in. Um, yeah, I can, I can okay. check a little bit. Like, I think that in captivity, baboons, like, historically have been viewed as kind of interchangeable because they can all breed with each other, even though, you know, the different what we call species are actually very, very far apart and they behave very differently. And, you know, where hybrids pop up, um, we actually see really interesting variation in behavior that are intermediate between the kinds of behavior you would expect each species to see. And it can also influence the ways in which hybridization occurs. Like at, at Amboseli, for example, there's a really famous study looking at this. So, um, so yeah, like I think, you know, some people have argued that all baboons are just Papiohamadryas, they're just one species, and all of those um, other species are just actually subspecies because they're all capable of interbreeding. So it, it kind of depends on what how you define a species, what we want to call all of these different kinds of baboons. So our uh, next question comes from our website uh, from Zelia, and she asks, um, uh, let's see here, how has climate change impacted your work? Erin, I feel like, yeah, you you definitely have had some <laughs> I could talk about this one. Yeah. Um, 
So I'm fortunate to work in Indonesia and I work in an area called central Kalimantan on the island of Borneo. And I work in a peatland habitat, which um, means that these are, we don't have a lot of true soils. It's mostly peat, which is full of carbon. So it burns. And what we've seen in these regions is an increase in the frequency and the magnitude of these peatland fires. Um, and that as it's gotten warmer, the climate's gotten warmer and hotter um, and there's less rain in the region, we see, especially during these El Nino and Enzo years, we see an increase in the magnitude of fires. And that has really uh, strong implications for the habitats where all of these different primates live and also their health. So we, we, we're actually, we're studying, we're currently studying how these fires influence and affect the health of wild orangutans, including stress levels and inflammation. So we'll have more to report soon on that. Thank you. Is there is there anyone else who'd like to chime in about climate before we move to the next question? I'm okay. talking a lot, but I can also <laughs> say, like my, my research project also looks at, at aspects of climate change. So my study with vervet monkeys that's, that's actually funded by the Leakey Foundation is looking at the effects of drought on gene expression across the drought condition. Because in, in South Africa, where I do my field work, um, you know, there's usually a, a heavy drought every um, 20 to 25 years or so. Um, but they're happening more frequently and more intensively. So my study is actually looking at differences in gene expression across the drought in 2017. Um, and that was the driest year on record in Southern Africa. So, so definitely, you know, looking at what genes are getting activated in response to these high temperatures and these drought conditions is something that we'll need to understand to understand how primates are actually going to kind of manage and adapt in response to these more extreme weather events. Well, our, our next question uh, comes from Keith, who asked a question that is very applicable to all of you, which is what does studying non-human primate behavior contribute to understanding ourselves? Uh, which is definitely what we are we're all interested in. Um, anyone want to uh, chime in first? Okay, Aaron, go ahead. This is a great question. And a lot of people ask us these quest this, this question. I think I, one thing, at least I can focus on my research is I look at the relationship between diet and health and diet and physiology in um, apes and in orangutans in particular. But one of the things that's interesting is that when you put humans in an experiment, you can't necessarily trust that they're gonna tell you the truth they've been eating. Um, and with, wild animals, we can actually watch them during all their waking hours and really get a good estimate of what they've been eating and what their nutritional intake is. Whereas with humans, sometimes they tend to not as much tell the truth or hide that second bowl of ice cream they had at night. Um, so with orangutans, we can kind of use them as a natural experiment to understand these relationships between physiology and health. And because we're so similar to them in so many ways, um, then we can really start to look at how variation, say, in macronutrient intake affects fluctuations in inflammation and energetics. I could just maybe quickly add go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You know, so much of thinking about ourselves is asking this question about how are we different? How are we unique? We are animals, but we seem to be very unique animals. And to understand that, we have to think about, okay, well, how do we compare to the other organisms on our, on our family tree? So to understand ourselves, whether it's at the behavioral level or the genomic level, we need a comparative context. And so understanding where we fit within this order, just how we compare to all these other, other taxa, other species, I think that is in part how we define ourselves. So I think that comparative context is kind of key to, to our introspection. Okay, let's, um, let's uh, well, actually, I guess, does anyone else have anything to add? I'm sure all of you have, have thoughts on, on this question, but we also have a lot of questions and can move on to the next one too. Okay, uh, let's I can say something. Oh, um, do. Yeah. Just also showing that some of the research work that have been done, I think by different 
primatologists goes to contribute in social um, connectedness and early life adversity and how those influence um, gene expression and health amongst other things. And so it's the same thing. If we are looking at wild population of animals and we are seeing how their connectedness is affecting their survival or um, how adversity is shaping what's going on, that helps us to better understand the environments that we live in and the things that we need to be taking care of. Are we supposed to be investing in uh, our social um, circle so that we have sufficient support? Uh, are we taking care to look at how early life adversity can affect adults downstream? So there are many things that um, primates do that can definitely inform uh, some of the things that are going on in humans as well. Wonderful. Um, that, it, it's really interesting to hear the different perspectives on, on this question. Um, so our next question comes from Jonathan. Uh, he says, uh, uh, hi, my question is, what are examples of symbolic behaviors in modern primates and what are the implication on how we classify our own organized belief systems, past and present, <laughs> which is, uh, is a very complex question. Uh, <laughs> and anyone want to jump in on this one? Okay, yeah, Aaron, go ahead. <laughs> I will admit I'm not an expert in the area of culture, but I did happen to do a postdoc with Carl Van Schaik, who's done a lot on this. And I'm, I wish Chris were here and she could jump back in because I know she knows a lot about this topic. But um, I can give an example with orangutans. So, um, and there's plenty of examples with chimpanzees as well, but with orangutans, for example, when they're building their nests in some populations, they do this raspberry vocalization. It kind of is like, when they're building their nest, they do that. And then, and other populations like where I work, they do um, a nest smack. So it's more like a, I, don't know, I can't even do it really well, but it's like a, while they're making it, and sometimes they'll pull a branch through their mouth and do it. There's clearly some kind of symbolic meaning because they, they do it even when there aren't other individuals around, but they're very consistent throughout in the individual populations. And some of these populations are only about 70 kilometers apart and separated by a river. So, I mean, this is just one example of a symbolic kind of one sim uh, symbolic gesture in non-human primates. And there's plenty of others uh, in the in the literature that focuses on culture with, with chimps, for example, different ways they clasp their hands and things like that. Um, how does it relate to our own belief system? I think that was the question. Maybe Ariel, can you put it up? I, I, I really don't have a great answer for that one. Um, but I think what's important is that we do see these symbolic um, behaviors modern primates that we also do see in humans. So it's not that this is a trait that's unique to humans. So um, uh, Chris uh, has some technical difficulties and uh, was not, it is so far not able to return, but we will, mm -hmm. um, we will maybe see if we can get her to give some input on that question as well. Uh, so our next question comes from Larry. Let's see here. Maybe. Ah, okay, here we go. Um, what are the current population numbers for chimps and bonobos? And what is the rate of decrease increase over the past 50 years? What well, it would this would have been a great question to field to Chris. Um, so why don't we'll, um, we'll put a pin in that one and get back to you, Larry. Um, okay, so let's, uh, what is our next question? We're all like, okay, so uh, going off of George, what sort of chromosomes do we share with early hominids? Brenda, maybe? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, clearly with other other apes, <laughs> chimps and, and bonobos, you know, if you're just comparing the letter code, we are 98.8% identical. There are other things like, you know, the structure of chromosomes and things where we change. And it is interesting that although in terms of our letter code, we're nearly identical to chimps and bonobos because our chromosomes are rearranged a bit differently. We have a different number of chromosomes compared to uh, chimps, bonobos and gorillas. Um, our chromosome one is a fusion of two of their chromosomes. 
So that in itself, I find pretty interesting that we can have chromosomal differences. And yet in terms of the DNA code, there be that there are very little differences. And maybe there's some functional impact in that in those differences in the chromosomes themselves. Um, and I'm not sure if this question was also asking about like chromosomal differences to, I don't remember what the, if it was hominin was the word used, but if they were also asking about like the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, and there it seems chromosomally we're pretty identical to the homin to the Neanderthals and Denisovans based on their genome data. I'm not sure, did I answer that question? There might've been another element to it or Chris or others, feel free to chime in. Well, and I, I, if, if we did not fully answer your question, you know, you can always follow up with another question to have a, uh, have clarification. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see here. What is the next question? It'll be a surprise for all of us. Okay. Uh, ah, this is, uh, what is your favorite hominid or hominid, uh, or I guess also primate? <laughs> Anyone want to jump in first? Well, I guess I should say orangutans because that's what I've spent the past 20 years studying and I do love them a lot, but I have really fallen in love with gibbons lately as well. Um, we, we started studying them recently, more recently at our site again, and they just amaze me in their agility in the forest. And I, I totally get why people that study gibbons are so in love with them because just they're just kind of mis majestic in the forest. So that's probably answers that question for me. If the question is about our favorite primate, you know, I study the evolution of hair and I tend to judge primates based on their hairstyles. <laughs> and I like Helmadrys baboons in particular because they look like they come straight out of a 1980s movie. They have that like crimped hairstyle. And then I also love eye eyes because they have the spiky black hair that has white tips at the ends that gives them a really, really kind of freaky appearance. So in terms of hairstyles, I would say homogenized baboons and eye eyes have some of the best. How about you, Mercy? Uh, I'm trying to think, you know, Kenya has so many primates and uh, they're all so beautiful. I, I think the black and white color bus looks really beautiful to me. I, I like it, but um, I'd have a bias to baboons that I've worked with for the last almost 20 years now. Yeah. How about you, Chris? <laughs> well, um, if we're talking primates, I love woolly monkeys because we, like I spent, for context, I spent like two years studying little woolly monkeys. I'm working with yellow-tailed woolly monkeys now. And despite all of this time with them, we still have no idea what they're doing socially. Like they are just kind of a mystery. Like, you know, I watch them all day, every day for years and I still don't know what they're doing. And that mystery is like very intriguing to me. If we're talking about hominins, um, I would say the Denisovan homin hominins are my favorite because we know everything we know about them from DNA instead of morphology and going kind of backwards from the DNA, we are now discovering fossils that we think are Denisovan or Denisovan. And to me, that process has just been really fascinating to watch unravel like in the literature. Like this is not something that I study, but I, I love teaching it because I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, there's so many, like I, I, I won't answer this one because I feel like... <laughs> I'm not, I'm not supposed to have a favorite, but I, I mean, I just, I, I feel like every time uh, I work with a scientist, it's like the, uh, the primate they study is the one I like the best. Cause I'm just like, Ooh. <laughs> um, okay. So let, let's uh, take our next question. Okay, uh, so Eva uh, asks uh, that uh, I've heard the debate over language ability of non-human apes. Do you think that chimps and other apes truly have the ability to understand human language and communicate with us in a real way? I, I could say something, but just from a captive primate um, experience in terms of communicating with us. There's, um, in a lot of zoos or even primate centers, there are components of training where animals are trained maybe uh, to do a particular task and then they get a reward or something like that. Um, 
And that seems to be some form of uh, communication, but that is definitely in the captive setup. So um, I wouldn't know how that looks like in the, in the wild. Yeah, I feel like, oh, I'm so glad, Chris. <laughs> oh, no, no, go ahead. I was like, this would be another one where I wish Chris Sabai were, were still uh, still with us. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, like, if we're talking about body language, like, we definitely communicate with our non-human primate subjects through body language. Like, if we stand in a threatening way or if we, like, turn our back on them, like, we can understand each other's body language and behavior perfectly fine because in across many primate species the you know the similar body language means something similar like dominance or submission or fear or you know etc so i think we can communicate those basic kinds of states um but if we're talking about actually like using sentences with each other to refer to something that's not right in front of us i think it's very limited without the kind of training that mercy is talking about wherein people have people have been able to train bonobos and chimpanzees in using, you know, like button boards that have like symbols on them that they can learn how to associate with particular objects and they can construct sentences by pressing different buttons. But that requires learning from infancy onward, essentially. So I think, um, you know, I think it's it's possible, but I think I think it is very much limited. Um, uh, our next question, I'm going to pull from our website, and this is another question from Zilia. Uh, what is something you've seen in the field that made you feel a connection with the animal you study? <laughs> Aaron. I can do this one. I remember one of the first times that I saw a female orangutan right after she gave birth. And it was a first time mom. It was in 2000 seven or eight, her name is Junie. And she was a first time mother. And I remember her kind of like pulling up this baby and holding it in her arm and looking at it with this look of just like, what just came out of me, but really looking at this baby in the eyes. And like, it just, to me, it felt like love. And it, it really made me relate. Um, because a year later, I had my first child. And I was like, yeah, now I get it. So I, I think that bond between a mother and an infant or a father, you know, I, I just, a parent and, and an infant, I felt like that was, I could connect with that. Well, that was an excellent example. Uh, I, I, anyone else? Cause I feel like this is a really interesting question. I remember the first time I felt really envious of a primate I was studying and that I was watching some lemurs in Madagascar and it was a downpour of rain and I was there with my like Gore-Tex jacket and I was still completely drenched. But then I was looking at the lemurs and they had their, you know, fluffy coat and the, the rain just seemed to be like bouncing off of them. They seemed not at all perturbed by the rain. <laughs> And I thought, oh, maybe this is part of why I study hair. <laughs> but I thought, oh, they're clearly suitable for this environment that I'm struggling to even sit still and maintain my body temperature. And so I think they were looking at me with pity. <laughs> uh, Chris and Mercy, do you have do you have experiences? Okay. I, yeah. I, I don't think it's something that uh like I can say, we would uh, was um, like reflecting on me personally, but just things that I've seen that are just interesting, like uh, just the primates just hanging out and grooming each other and just relaxing. You can see just the setup that they have, that kind of uh, social aspect that they have, and that reminds me a lot about home because uh, here in Africa, we we people really really love just having social connections and things like that. So also seeing how the primates just enjoy that. I think that resonates with me uh, to some extent, yeah. And then uh, Chris, do you have a, do you have a, a moment? Yeah, I guess so. Um, like one of my first big long-term primate field experiences was as a field assistant on Susan Perry's white face capuchin project in Costa Rica, which has been going on for ages since the 1990s, early 1990s. And um, 
white face capuchins are just like watching them every day is like watching a soap opera like they fight they have sex they fight again they make up they you know are terrible to each other they're terrible to other animals and they do it like they change their behavior from five seconds you know every every like couple of minutes like collecting behavioral data on them is a nightmare but it was just so entertaining and so i don't know like enriching like it was basically like watching uh it was like basically like watching middle school happen all over again <laughs> so for me uh, you know like it was very kind of um affirming of like the messy child that i was seeing these capuchins behave in the way that they did um but also really interesting like just thinking about you know correlates to human behavior and, and what it might mean to see these um kind of similarities between us and them Uh, so the next question comes from Hope, um, and Hope asks, what kind of issues you run into during your field work among different primate social groups? Chris, I feel like you probably <laughs> have stories about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, if we bring up the capuchins again, when two different groups run into each other, it's not usually nice. They get into a huge fight. They chase each other back and forth, like some monkeys are having sex in the background over there and everybody's like, what's happening? It's kind of chaos. Um, but you know, when I started doing work with woolly monkeys, it was a totally different experience. Um, in woolly monkeys, like two groups get together and sometimes they fight, but usually they don't. They just kind of merge with each other and then travel together for a long period of time to the point where you're like, who is even in this group? What's even happening here? And, you know, kind of the, the collective like wisdom among primatologists is that, you know, groups, when they don't have enough resources, they're going to fight. Um, and if there are enough resources, maybe they won't fight because they don't have to compete for them. But like with woolly monkeys, we like couldn't detect any pattern. And so, yeah, like I would say I've had a wide range of intergroup experiences with monkeys. Like by far the most interesting have been like the tolerant or even the ones where it seems like they're almost seeking each other out to travel together. Cause that's just kind of a, again, a mystery to me that woolly monkeys make fascinating. Okay, so let's see here. Our, our next question, um... Uh, so we're running out of time, which I realized so I want to get to try to get to as many questions as I can. Um, let's see here. Boop -a -doo. Um, oh, we had one. Uh, why can't great apes swim instinctively like other mammals? And this is uh, from Colin on Facebook. I don't know if anybody has a, a thought on this one. Oh, Aaron, go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to take a stab at this. I'm not really sure because I'm not really a morphologist, but I think I remember reading somewhere that it has something to do with the position of our, our head, rel our, the position of our head relative to our, the rest of our uh, postcranium morphology um, that we'd have to, when we're in the water, we have to like hold our head up to keep our nose out of the water. Whereas other mammals, it's kind of more natural, but I'm not really sure. And something also about buoyancy, in primates maybe, I don't know. Maybe Chris knows better than me. <laughs> I mean, I'd say it really depends on what species you're looking at because a lot of, of monkeys in the Americas swim regularly and it's because the Amazon basin um, used to just be a, like during the evolutionary history of those monkeys, it was a gigantic inland lake. And so um, like holler monkeys, woolly monkeys, um, we've seen a lot of these monkeys actually swim across rivers. So yeah, I, I think it really depends on the species that you're talking about and where they're found and whether or not they, you know, need to cross water. So our, uh, we're going to take two more questions because we're running out of time. But um, uh, the next one is uh, from our website. And let's see here, what is it? It's uh, how do birth intervals vary in primates? Uh, how long is gestation and the average age of mothers? Um, so it's a, a bunch of questions that are each have a different answer depending on what primate you're looking at. So um, Aaron, <laughs> yeah, uh, you do a lot of work on this. So I mean, it, it really does. That's one of the most incredible things about primates is that and that I teach in my class, there's so much variation because you have some species like orangutans that have an inner birth interval of about eight years and don't start reproducing to their somewhere between 12 and 15. And then you have other species uh, like some of the um, marmoset species 
that are reproducing every year, or year and a half, sometimes twice a year. Um, and they start much earlier in life, like at age two or three or four. So, you know, you've got this range of variation um, that is incredible among primate, the primate order. And so um, I, I don't even think we could say what is the average age of reproduction or the average inner birth interval, because I think they range from about six months to about eight years. So maybe someone else wants to add something. Yeah, yeah mercy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can add something. I, th I thought this question is interesting because um, part of what I, we published, I think in 2019, the work I was doing with helminths, we did show that the presence of helminths, like the different type of helminths, which we call parasite richness, or the burden of like maybe just one particular helminth. And what we showed is that the more an animal has um, a high helminth burden, it, it, it increases the interbirth intervals. So it will increase the duration of pregnancy, the duration uh, before cycling, the uh, what is called like the postpartum uh, duration. So that kind of having parasites uh, is going to increase that. And the assumption is that the, the primate is going to have a trade-off where uh, a lot of the resources are going into the immune system to fight off the infection as opposed to investing into reproductive uh, effort. So I thought it was nice to just also let us know that parasites also have an impact on, on interbath intervals. Well, before we tackle our last question, I just wanna give a special shout out to Pete, George, Mary, Rachel, Meredith, Renee, um, Jonathan, Keith, uh, let's see here, what else do we have, uh, Mary, um, Sullivan, Michael, Eva, uh, Neanderthal09, um, and oh, oh, Alpine, uh, and let's see here, oh, World of Paleoanthropology, thank you for watching, uh, Matt, uh, Joe, Jeffrey, Victoria, uh, just thank you all so much for watching, I, we love seeing your comments, uh, we also want to thank the Anna Gordon Getty Foundation, Camilla and George Smith, the Joan and Arnold Travis Education Fund, uh, and really all of you out there who make this, you know, these episodes possible. So now let us go into our last question. Um, and then we actually have a quiz for you too. So I guess it's almost, uh, so are there any updates on the endangered status of primates, good and bad news? <sighs> yeah, Aaron, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I could jump in, but I, I'd love to see everyone else do that too. Yeah. Just because I think, I think it varies. Again, there's so much variation, and in some species, we're seeing they're becoming more critically endangered, like more endangered, and um, you know, going to skipping up to higher or uh, more endangered levels on the on the IUCN red list categories. But then I think that other primate species, depending on conservation actions in in communities and in, in host countries, are starting to do better and improve. So I think there's a real mixed batch and it really depends on the species and the location where these species are found so it's a really hard question to ask overall for primate species because some are doing better than they were 10 years ago and some are doing far worse than they were but i think overall we're seeing a trend if we were talking about overall trends that more and more species are entering into the um endangered categories of the iucm red list Yeah, um, Brenda, just yeah. to chime into that, it is a lot of bleak news, <laughs> but that's why it is good to remember, as Erin was saying, that there are some success stories, like the mountain gorillas <laughs> are doing so much better than people would have predicted, you know, 30 years ago, and that is because of the work of the local people in Rwanda and Uganda. So it is a good reminder that if efforts are made, concerted efforts are made, that there is hope. <laughs> Things might look bleak, but populations can turn around if, yeah, if there are these concerted efforts in place. So to go along with our, with that question, we actually have a quiz for our viewers. Um, so let us put the quiz up. It will be uh, which of the animals you see on screen is critically endangered. So you have 30 seconds starting just a few seconds ago.
Okay, let's see here. We are starting to see some some answers. We have uh, uh, the lemur, um, the lemur, uh, or A, the lemur, um, C, uh, which was the injury. Um, oh, A, B, and C, which is a, a fair. Uh, the lemur again from uh, and lemur. So let's take a look at what the answer is. Yeah, it is the injury. So uh, George, uh, congratulations. You are the uh, one who got it correct. Um, so uh, I just wanna thank all of you out there for watching. Thank you, Mercy, Brenda, Chris, and Aaron for being here with us today. And also thank you to Chris Sabai. We will be looping back with her to get some of those questions of yours answered because uh, we don't want to let those questions go unanswered. So um, again, just... You know, thank you all so much for watching. Um, I guess, uh, uh, do any of you have any parting words to say? I just want to say huge thanks to the Leaky Foundation. So much of these things we talked about and our knowledge of primates is because of the investment the Leaky Foundation makes in this type of research. Absolutely. Thank you for having this and for having us here. It's been really fun. Thank you. Thanks, Ariel, for having me as well. Well, thank you all for taking a break from your day and feeding your brain with the Leaky Foundation and celebrating um, uh, Earth Day uh, a little early. Uh, so <laughs> until next time, stay hungry for knowledge. Bye, everyone. Lunch Break Science is brought to you by the Leaky Foundation and made possible by the generous support of the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation, Camilla and George Smith, and the Joan and Arnold Travis Education Fund, as well as viewers like you. Show your support of Lunch Break Science by subscribing to our channel, clicking on notifications, and giving us a thumbs up, or making a donation to help us create new content. Still craving science and can't wait for the next episode? You can feast on the Leaky Foundation's content library with past episodes, lectures, our podcast origin stories, and more. Thank you all for tuning in and see you next time.